Cam Edwards of bearing arms on the House of Sullivan's ban, plus divergent reactions to the armed bystander who stopped an Indiana mall shooting. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I made the devil run. I gave him poison just for fun. I had one friend. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also the founder of the Reload.com, where you can head over and check out our membership options today if you want to get this podcast a day early, have an opportunity to appear on the podcast, and get exclusive access to hundreds of pieces of analysis and, and stories that you won't find anywhere else. Um, or you could just uh, sign up for our free weekly newsletter that goes out every Friday. It gives you a roundup of what's what's going on in news, uh, gun news, <laughs> and uh, you get an idea of what we do. Uh, but this week, we have another great gun writer on the show, uh, one of my good friends uh, and another uh, editor of a publication that you should check out and follow, uh, Cam Edwards of Bearing Arms. Welcome to the show, Cam. Thank you, Stephen. It's always good to be here. Appreciate you coming on my show We're earlier in the week as well. That's right. We're doing another crossover episode. <laughs> I think we did this before. It's always good to to get updated with somebody else who uh, I think is, is very knowledgeable about what's going on in uh, especially the political world when it comes to guns. And this week, uh, is another busy week. I mean, it's been it's been a, a streak of extremely busy uh, gun weeks uh, for the last I don't know couple months here. Really, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, um, we're in a supercharged time, right, for the second yeah. time, especially after Bruin, and you've got you know Democrats reacting to Bruin and and coming. It's not just Bruin. I mean, it's Dobbs, too. Right. I mean, Democrats have sort of decided that, OK, it's it's cool to go after the Supreme Court right now. Uh, and we got to show the base that we're fighting. And so we're seeing, you know, all kinds of things, including, uh, you know, the just wave of gun control bills that have come at the state level and, and, and now in the House of Representatives, too. Yeah. I mean, we've seen obviously you had had the big Supreme Court decision, which is the first major landmark decision on guns in over a decade, uh, really. And uh, then then you obviously you also had the Uvalde shooting, which is a huge uh, sea change event in in. Uh, guns because of how horrible it was and the reaction to it, which led directly to the bipartisan gun bill that passed uh, the House and Senate was signed into law just last month. That is the first new restrictions on firearms at the federal level you've seen in 30 years, Um, whether, you know, it's debatable about how significant they are, but but uh, still pretty big deal overall passing a gun bill at all. And um, and now we see a new push for an assault and ban in the House of Representatives. We just had the House Judiciary Committee vote to, uh, they went through the markup for their assault and ban and they voted to uh, move it out of committee. So there's, we don't have a schedule yet for when, as, at least as of filming this, and we're, we're doing this on Thursday, so uh, we don't have a schedule yet uh, for the bill being put on the floor. I mean, frankly, we might not get one uh, which we'll talk about, but but this is the big push. You're seeing the, this is the first movement on an assault weapons ban since the federal assault weapons ban in 1994. Yeah, and it's interesting. So your first reaction? Well, you know, it's interesting because this bill has been around for over a year, right? David Cicilline uh, uh, voted uh, or introduced this with uh, Diane Feinstein back in 2021. So Feinstein's got the companion bill, uh, and Cicilline has the uh, the House bill. And you're right; it hasn't gotten so much as a committee hearing. Uh, until now, which I, I find very interesting, given that, you know, Joe Biden talks all the time about uh, the supposed need to ban so-called assault weapons. Uh, so why are Democrats just moving on this in the House now? And I think the answer is that this isn't the only bill that the Democrats are moving on. Right. So we just saw them uh, hold a vote on uh, protecting gay marriage or having states recognize gay marriage across state lines. Right. Uh, uh, we're seeing a, a vote on contraception. I'm protecting the ability to purchase contraception. So I think this is one of a series of bills that Democrats are, are show bills. Basically, the Democrats are holding to try to put Republicans, you know, on the defense uh, on some issues that that generally, um, you know, polls 65, 70 percent approval for, you know, recognizing gay marriage, for ensuring access to contraception. The weird thing is, though, Stephen, as you and I were talking right before we got started here, I mean, a a ban on so-called assault weapons isn't nearly as popular 
as some of these other items. And I think we're already seeing that in terms of Democrats, some Democrats um, not going along with this proposal. So we know that Jared Golden of Maine is out. Uh, he's a no on the bill. Uh, Henry Cuellar of uh, Texas is a no. There are about a half dozen or so other Democrats who said, well, I'm, I'm taking a wait and see approach. They haven't committed to voting for this. And, and again, as of Thursday, it's unclear. I don't think Democrats have the votes in the House. Uh, David Cicilline said on Wednesday that they were still one or two votes short. Um, I talked with Larry Keene of the National Shooting Sports Foundation today, and he said, you know, wait and see what happens in the Rules Committee next week, because if the votes aren't there, he doesn't think Nancy Pelosi is going to allow the Rules Committee to even take it up and bring it onto the House floor. So it, it is it's it's I understand the motivation for Democrats in doing this. When you look at the issue polls that have come out right now, you know, the economy and inflation is the top issue by far for Republicans and independents. But then when you look at Democrats, it's it's right up there with abortion. It's right up there with gun policy. Um, they're not nearly as interested in talking about the state of the economy right now for some strange reason. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think there's a, a a reason why they're doing this. I don't think it's necessarily designed to appeal to the to the middle. Uh, I think it's a designed to reassure their base that they're fighting. And, you know, we'll see how 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 good that does. I mean, the fact that David Hogg interrupted this uh, House hearing yesterday to, you know, bloviate and, and preen for the cameras um, tells me that the uh, younger Democratic cohort anyway is is less than impressed with with show votes. Yeah, that's probably true. But and, and I want to get into some more of the polling in a minute. But first, uh, why don't we go over what's in this? This all has been, I guess, uh, just to lay it out for people what this policy would actually do, um, because obviously assault weapon is, uh, you know, it's a political term. It can mean different things depending on what jurisdiction you're in. You know, as far as the states, the, the handful of states that have an assault weapon span, they, they kind of all define it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some core similarities, of course, but uh, this bill would be different than, than many of the state bills as well. Um, it, it would also be different from the previous federal ban in 1994. Uh, the main difference being that um, instead of two features, uh, you can only have one feature now before before the gun is banned. But effectively, it's a um, semi-automatic center fire rifle. Uh, actually, is it is it even center fire? I think, yeah, I think there is the, there's, you know, the, the, the general exception for like rimfire uh, uh, rifles. So, yeah. Rimfire, I, uh, yeah, it, it, I think you're right. But so, uh, you know, rifle, uh, center fire, semi automatic uh, that includes one uh, or more of these banned features, which uh, are um, you know, generally considered to be cosmetic features, things like, uh, you know, barrel shrouds and, and um, telescoping stocks and pistol grips, flash suppressors, bayonet lugs. They still have all the old stuff from the 90s on there. Like barrel shot is not really a thing you you see very much of anymore. But, but uh, you know, is, that would apply. They're, they're trying to go after the, the heart of this is to go after AR-15s and, and AK-47s and, and their various, uh, you know, derivatives of those guns. Um, which it doesn't fully do as, as you know, has long been the, the complaint about these sorts of bans, but also it goes well beyond a lot of those guns too, uh, because of the way that they are defining what an assault weapon is. It also includes semi-automatic shotguns that have um, certain features. It includes uh, certain handguns that uh, based on their weight or whether they have certain features like a, um, a foregrip on a pistol would make it an assault weapon. Um, so, you know, it, it's a pretty expansive definition, mm -hmm. uh, much more expansive than the 94 definition because it moves from uh, you, you can't have two or more of these features down to you can't have one or more of these features. Which So there's a lot more guns that are going to be caught up in this uh, this time around. Correct? Yeah, there are. Um, I, well, certainly there are a lot more guns out there now. Right. I mean, the National Shooting Sports sure. Foundation just said this week that there are, in their estimates, about twenty four and a half million uh, modern sporting rifles in, in private hands. That doesn't cover the pistols or the shotguns, as you mentioned, that would also be covered under this ban. So, in, in, yeah, in some ways it is um, much more uh, encompassing and, and much more sweeping. But it's also 
odd, Stephen, that, you know, the what they agreed on in the rule or in the Judiciary Committee yesterday was that uh, apparently now large capacity magazines are 15 rounds, not 10, uh, which I find odd, right. you know. Um, and the, the bill does not go as far as Joe Biden's campaign plan. You know, Joe Biden said, listen, here's what we're going right. to do. Uh, we're going to, you know, ban these guns and you can either turn them over to the government or you can register them under the National Firearms Act. And then we promise we'll let you keep them forevermore. Um, this simply grandfathers in existing gun owners right now. You can't transfer your firearm. You can't give it to somebody else unless you die. And I think maybe then you can pass it on to your kids. Um, but it doesn't do anything at the moment to uh, address the weapons of war, the 24 million uh, weapons of war that are in the hands of American civilians. And I find that, again, to be just a very it's a tell that, that this really is about politics and this is about the final vote. They don't care what the details are. They want to be able to pass something so they can tell their base, look, we passed a gun ban. Uh, and, and they're not going to get caught up in the details. But for gun owners who, who actually look at these things are going to be impacted by these things. I think it is very interesting to look at the changes that Democrats have made uh, to try to bring some of their more reluctant colleagues along, including you know, adding five round capacity to, uh, to magazines before they're banned, uh, including the grandfather clause. No gun control group was asking for the grandfather clause to be in this bill. And no gun rights group was talking to the Democrats who crafted this bill. So, again, this is a, uh, a this is a design, um, a, a feature, not a bug of the legislation. And I think, it, again, it's there just to try to goose passage. It's interesting. I, I don't know. When I look at it, uh, well, well, first off, I guess we should, we should note that, um, you know, they, they might not care about the deals and they might not even really understand the details, I think is fairly clear from yesterday's hearing uh, where uh, the, the sponsor of this bill, Rep. Uh, Cicilline, uh, tried to argue that uh, so this bill also bans um, uh, pistol braces, uh, stabilizing pistol pistol braces. Uh, and, and Rep. Cicilline tried to explain that that was included in this bill because uh, the combination of a pistol brace and a buffer tube creates a bump stock, which allows the gun to fire at a higher rate of fire than than you otherwise would be able to, which uh, is, is, of course, completely wrong. Um, you know, a stabilizing brace is, is a replacement for a, a butt stock. Yeah. It, it isn't a bump stock. A bump stock is a device that allows you to bump fire more easily, which increases your rate of fire. Pistol braces don't do that in any way. But it's just sort of an indicator of how little institutional knowledge there is about firearms in, uh, you know, among the Democratic caucus, I think, uh, including the people who ostensibly authored mm -hmm. this bill, although I'm sure he did not literally <laughs> author the bill, clearly. Um, I mean, this, you know, I look at this bill, it seems like a, it's all, it's kind of like a dinosaur. It's, it's from the, the 90s. You know, it's very much that federal ban. And then they, instead of, they were like, well, instead of two features, we're going to make it one feature. Yes. So it'll be more. It's guns. funny that you. But if you look at, because you look at where they're yeah. gone in the last 30 years on assault weapons bans in California or, or New York or Massachusetts, and they're they're way past what what this stuff, these old definitions. They're you know they're into copycats mm -hmm. and, and bullet buttons and all this all this stuff that's come up in the intervening years as issues and uh, or workarounds, and they've they've uh, so they've modern definitions of assault weapons ban you know in in these in states that have them are way more uh you know th this is like 20 year old language basically 30 year old language. well that's what you get i think when you when you co-sponsor a bill with feinstein uh and you know you, you gotta have her input in there as well but you know you're right and it's funny because when i was talking with larry Keene today he actually said i feel like i've gotten in mr peabody's wayback machine i don't know if you're old enough for that rock and bullwinkle reference but uh, <laughs> yes. uh you know he said i feel like we've gone back to the 1990s not only with the uh, so-called the Sobens ban, but with the lawsuits against gun manufacturers. And, and I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, California has I mean, well, they've, they've changed the definition of what a so-called assault weapon is three times, four times since their original legislation. Right. I mean, they just keep going back and say, well, now it means it? this. Be and now it means that. that. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you've got your featureless rifles. They put in the bullet buttons. That was a that was a feature that gun control advocates wanted. 
And then they realize, oh, no, that's, that's it's not working the way we wanted it to. So now we've got to get rid of it and blame the uh, the gun lobby for the inclusion of the bullet button. I mean, you know, all of this is so ridiculous. And again, as the end of the day, we're talking about a farm that's in common use for lawful purposes, you know, owned by tens of millions of Americans and a gun that is used in fewer crimes than fewer homicides anyway than than fists, feet or hammers or knives. Uh, and, I, you know, at some point, I think you just have to wonder what what is the point of this other than politics and other than trying to show your base I'm fighting because I got to tell you, I don't think these bans are going to be upheld by the courts uh, under the uh, the Bruin test. And I sure as heck don't think that they're going to do anything to make us any safer. Well, look, obviously, the the supporters argument, the, the Democratic uh, position on these bans is that they will help reduce mass shootings. That's mainly what they focus on, because a number of high profile mass shootings, including obviously Uvalde and others have have involved uh, AR-15s or, or similar uh, firearms. And so that's why they target these guns. Um, and that seems that's uh, been the main driving force behind uh, support for these policies over the last you know 30 years. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously, as you say, there's a lot of questions as to whether or not this would have any real impact on on mass shootings, especially given that while ARs are used in some high profile mass shootings, they aren't actually the majority of uh, guns used in uh, active mm-hmm. shooter situations, according right. to the FBI. You know, we, I just I just had uh, the agent who came up with that definition and, re- and report from the FBI on active shooters, and she said that two thirds are handguns, um, as you might expect. Uh, but but uh, you know that that is obviously the the point of view that they've gotten across. Uh, I do think that there is uh, speaking of the '90s and being stuck in the '90s. I do feel like the mentality that you see from uh, Democrats and, and honestly from media a lot as well is stuck in, you know, in the 90s in terms of the polling support they believe there is for these sorts of policies. So, you know, we mentioned this briefly earlier, but but the polling has changed significantly in recent years on assault bans. bans. Uh, we saw the three most recent uh, polls from major uh, pollsters, including you know, Quinnipiac and, and Gallup, both show an actual a, a decrease in support for these policies since Uvalde, which is pretty surprising, uh, I think, to anyone who's followed gun politics for uh, you know, a significant por- portion of time. Usually, you'll see support for gun control go up in the wake of a high-profile mass shooting. So that's really is one as bad as Uvalde was. And um, you have seen that with other policies. You've seen the general support for gun control or tightening gun laws go up, but you've actually seen support for the assault and span decrease. And now the latest polling from Quinnipiac indicates that it's below 50 percent. They have a all time low, a new all time low set. The previous all time low was set last month. And the new now they they have a new all time low at forty nine percent support. Uh, now that's still more than the forty five percent who opposed the bill. Uh, but but I mean uh, you know you still you have Cicilline out there telling the caucus, according to Politico, that you know this is a two third support issue, and he doesn't understand why it's politically controversial or a hard vote. And it's like, well, the, I don't know that he's living in. The current day, as far as polling. I mean, I guess it depends on what poll you're looking at. You mentioned that there are still some polls out there showing support in the the mid 60s or so. Okay, one. You know, one. Yeah, there is one morning consult Politico poll found this okay. in June. They found 66 percent. However, even that is down from the t- the highs. Uh, they had 70 percent back in 2000. Yeah, and see, I think so. that's the real key here. I mean. You know, again, when I was talking earlier about support for gay marriage, you've seen support for gay marriage increase uh, across the board, including among Republicans over the past 20 years. Right. Support for. Yeah, and in fact, that bill might might actually. Yeah. Pass, even if it's going right. to be a show bill. That yeah, might pass absolutely. The, the but but it, but again, you know, it's a very different situation when it comes to these types of gun bans. And I, I, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think one. You've got more gun owners. Um, again, according to NSSF, last year, 2.8 million modern sporting rifles were sold. 
Uh, I think probably a healthy number of those were to, you know, new gun owners or at least first time rifle buyers. Um, and many of those individuals may not be rock ribbed Republicans. Uh, you know, they may be independent voters. Some of them undoubtedly were Democrats. Um, so, I, you know, I think I think it's hard for somebody to say, yeah, I, I go ahead and ban the gun I just bought. Uh, so I think that might account for why we're seeing a, you know, a slight decline in support for these bans. But I also would like to think that the American people who I acknowledge, most of them are not gun owners. Most of them probably don't know much about gun laws, probably think very little about the intricacies of gun laws. I don't blame them for that. Um, and, you know, and I don't I don't say that they're ignorant in a derogatory fashion. I just mean an absence of knowledge. I can understand how a, a low information voter would say, well, yeah, uh, universal background checks are good. You know, everybody should go through a background check before they buy a gun. Not thinking about okay, how they're going to work in practice. But I, I would like to think that more Americans have come to the logical conclusion of banning guns isn't the answer in a country where you've got the right to keep and bear them. And maybe in a country where we've got, you know, we're awash with guns, right? We've got more guns than people. So what's the point of trying to ban uh, uh, guns and use that as the strategy to try to reduce violent crime? Um, it seems to me like in, in general, what you're seeing are Americans supportive of uh, at least in theory, you know, um, ensuring that people who are not prohibited persons are not violent criminals are not adjudicated mentally ill, uh, that the right sort of people, quote unquote, uh, can get a gun and the wrong sort of people can't. That's what they're in favor of more so than, well, let's go after this gun over there and that gun over there and see what happens. Yeah, I think that's I mean, I, I think I agree with your take there on the just the general approach of most Americans towards gun policy. Uh, you know, and I think the the reason that you're seeing this this downturn in support for solvents bans, which I, I don't think either of us necessarily expected to see in the immediate aftermath of Vivaldi, right? I, I didn't think it was going to go that way. No, because there is still that emotional you know response right away. So no, you're right. It is surprising that the numbers actually went down and they didn't went, go up. Just yeah, a I bit. mean, and even the morning consult poll. Uh, the, the, you know, the, they did a couple polls. They did one before they did, they did two before of all day. They did one the day after, um, you know, May 25th. And then they did another one in June and you know, what they found or another two in June. And what they found was, of there was, so there was a, you know, it started at 70% back in 2019. It dropped to, I believe it was uh, 67% uh, when they, the first poll that they did this year. Then it went down a little bit to 65. Then it, it jumped slightly uh, to 67 and went back down to 66 that it's at now. So it's decreased slightly. Uh, you know, and it's really so it's a very slight increase. I mean, in that's the, all within yeah, it's the all basically in the margin. Of well, error. yeah, I mean, it's all in the margin of error. It's 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 that statistical noise. At right. That point, so that, you really know, the mark, morning consults showing not much change at all in support one way or the other. Yeah. The other polls have shown a more dramatic decrease, but probably. Part of that may be because they didn't pull it as frequently as Morning Consult did. And, it, you know, so you might just be seeing a lower level generally of support for this policy. And it just hasn't really been affected strongly by the recent, uh, you know, high profile shootings we've seen, which is, I think, itself very telling. Whether you think the support is at the Morning Consult level or the the uh, Quinnipiac level is is another discussion, but to me, you know, I, I think the reason you're not seeing as much support for it as you were in any of these polls, these, none of these polls are at all time highs. Uh, you know, that's that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, is is that more people buy own these? Like you like you mentioned, more people own them, so more people know people who own them. I think it's very common now for somebody to, uh, if if you know someone who owns guns there's a very good chance that you know someone who owns an AR-15 in the United States. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. But I, you know, I wonder too, for just from the political perspective, when Cicilline says, I don't understand why my colleagues aren't so willing to go along with this. I wonder how many Democrats are aware that when it comes to gun control, even these polls that show 80% support for an issue don't actually translate to 80% support for an issue, right? Uh, universal background checks, uh, perfect example of this. I mean, 
we're told 90 percent of Americans support universal background checks. So Washington State in 2014 or 2016, they have, I think it was 2014. They have the referendum. Oh, 2016. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they have their referendum. Well, Nevada, too, uh, was 2016. Right. Washington State, I think it was like 63 percent, which was the highest. Mm-hmm. Right. Nevada, it was 51 percent closer to like 50.5 percent. And in Maine, it was 48 yep. percent. So, you know, in none of those states did you see the the, the 80 or 90 percent approval for universal background checks that the polling would indicate. Right. So so what does that translate to when you're talking about, you know, criminalizing the purchase and sale and transfer of one of the most commonly owned firearms in the country? I mean, I think when when people really start to dig into the details of this, and like, oh, I can go to prison. Oh, oh, I didn't realize. Oh, it's a felony offense. That I mean, that's when you start to see support crater, you know, and and two. And again, I don't know how much of a role this is playing, but I, it's, it's playing at least, I think, some factor here. Um, there was a story uh, today about how there are some on the left who worry about New York's new post Bruin concealed carry laws leading to mass incarceration. There is a, a, a portion of the left that says, listen, these gun control laws don't do anything to stop violent criminals, but they end up putting a lot of young black and brown men, a disproportionate number of young black and brown men in prison for possessory offenses, for things that aren't a crime in most states. Uh, you know, we saw a, just a, a fantastic uh, brief by public defenders in the Bruin case. Cook County public defenders come out and said the same thing. Uh, Wayne County public defenders in Detroit. Uh, have come out and argued against uh, uh, charging people for carrying a, a firearm in their vehicle uh, without a concealed carry license, which is considered a, a violent felony in the state of Michigan. So there, there's at least some portion of the left who looks at these laws and does think, what are the unintended consequences here? They may not like the Second Amendment. They may not like gun ownership, but they're also not in favor of, uh, again, if they believe the criminal justice system is slanted and and predisposed to go after you know, black, uh, young black males, young Hispanic males, uh, they may not be on board with a gun ban like this. Yeah. Well, uh, and to your point, uh, there's actually just recently a DOJ report on federal gun prosecutions. And it turns out that 54 percent of uh, defendants in those cases are African-American, which obviously there are 54 percent of the country is not African-American. So, uh, right. You know, not, that doesn't. Yeah, there's there's a lot more to get into that we're not going to be able to on this particular episode. But I, it's Corey uh, Bush, who's a um, you know a black Democrat in the House, uh, did raise exactly those points uh, in uh, her explanation for why she did not co-sponsor the assault weapons ban uh, this time around. Uh, how, of course, um, you know she she explained that in Politico. There's a piece on it. People want to check it out, but. But uh, she did. She still supports the bill. You know, it's, uh, it's it, I, you know, she voted for it to move through the Judiciary Committee and she's likely to vote for it if it makes it to the floor, she said. But she is concerned. She has the concerns that you've outlined there uh, about adding new, uh, I guess, uh, you know, new laws to the books that are going to impact uh, minority communities disproportionately uh, or have the potential to do so. Um, so, you know, some of that is breaking through, I think. Uh, on some level, and uh, it does. It just adds another degree of concern for for the last couple Democrats who have yet to come on board, and it it really does legitimately raise the question of whether or not they can get to two sixteen, which is what they need right now because of the makeup of Congress. But uh, you know, with resignations and you know uh, vacant seats and stuff, they, they only need two sixteen. But but you know, um, I, to me, it's just the the, the timing of everything also indicates that it's going to be a really hard vote because if Democrats had they, th- this is <laughs> gun policy debates have not changed very much in 30 years. Right. It's been the same two issues. Now, we have seen some variation on that this year because the you know, obviously we got that bipartisan deal that didn't deal with the universal background check bill or an assault wins ban. But uh, most of our time is spent on those two policies. And the Democrats have never tried to pass an assault weapons ban to this point, uh, and they haven't tried to pass it, uh, you know, since the last one expired, at least in 2004. 
Uh, and they haven't tried to pass it the last four years. They've had control of the House, which indicates that they think it's a hard vote for a lot of their members to take. You know, whatever they might say publicly or whatever any analyst mm-hmm. might say, whatever you and I might say, uh, just the the actions speak louder than words. Right. They If they thought it was going to be an easy vote, they would have taken it a long time ago. You know, this. Uh, there have been plenty of opportunities after mass shootings over the last four years to do this policy or at any time in between. If they just I'm sure, you know, some people in that caucus think it's a good policy. Right. They they oh, they mm-hmm. think this is the right answer. So they would have done it if they could have. It's always, a, you know, a top talking point on guns for Democrats, including the president, as you mentioned. And they just haven't done it because they don't have the. You know, it's going to be hard. They, they didn't do it. And they, they passed the whole gun control package in the aftermath of Uvalde that included a magazine ban, but not yep. an assault weapons ban. And so, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I, I don't know. What, what do you think? Where do you think they're, where it's going to end up? I, you know, I think it's going to be close. Um, I think they're going to pull out. Listen, they're going to pull out all the stops to try to get this across the finish line. Right. And you're you're you've got two Republicans that will cross over, uh, I think, in Kinzinger uh, and in Chris Jacobs. I'm curious to see what Brian Mass does in Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's previously come out in favor of a, a ban on so-called assault weapons. He also faces an August primary challenge. He is not a co-sponsor to this bill. Yeah, no Republican co-sponsors uh, and, right now. Uh-uh. And I, I wonder if Brian Mast finds a way to vote against this particular bill while maintaining his uh, openness to a gun ban in principle. Um, I, I, you know, he, he's one that I'm, I'm, I'm watching just because it's it's been interesting uh, to see you know how he's handled this issue since 2018. Um, I think again, I think it's going to be close. I would predict that I'll predict that it will pass. Uh, by one or two votes with a lot of strong arming, but I would not be shocked at all if it fails by one or two votes. Although, actually, I, I will I, I, let me let me amend that. I will be shocked if it fails by one or two votes because I don't think Pelosi is going to bring it to the floor for a vote yeah. if if she if she doesn't know the votes are there. This will just kind of quietly fade away. Oh, we didn't have time. We got caught up in some other piece of legislation. Uh, and uh, look, August recess is here. Sorry. Um, th- you know, that'll that'll be what happens to the uh, to the gun ban bill. And of course, if it does get out of the House, it's going nowhere in the Senate. Right. So, again, it's a it's a purely performative vote. Uh, I don't think it even has 50 votes uh, in the Senate. Uh, right now, there are 37 co-sponsors. Um, so, you know, it. it, it this is I, I don't even look at this particular bill as a, oh, my gosh, they're coming for my guns because I know that the bill's not going to pass. I look at this bill and say, oh, my God, they're so worried they're hunting for for votes right now. They're trying to convince, uh, you know, uh, their Democratic base, just please turn out and, and vote for us. Pay no attention uh, to what's going on at the gas pump. Pay no attention to what's going on when you go and, and uh, you know, get your groceries every week. And again, I just don't think that that this issue is going to resonate with even enough of the Democratic base to really substantially improve their election fortunes this November. Yeah, I think everything you said there is, <laughs> again, I would agree with it because, I mean, it, look, you'll, you'll know if it's going to pass based on whether it gets a vote. If it gets scheduled for a vote next week, it's going to pass. That's my that's I, w- I would bet everything on that. But yep. it's going to be super close. It's I mean, they have a little bit of wiggle room because you got there's four Republicans that I could see doing it just because uh, the two that you mentioned, the three you mentioned. But uh, there's also uh, um, uh, Upton, I believe, would be another one. But uh, because there were four people who voted for the magazine ban, who four Republicans who voted for that. Uh, that was the closest mm-hmm. vote in that package that the House passed. They only got 220 votes for that. So they can afford to lose four votes and still pass this from that that high watermark. And there's because that's it's a fairly analogous policy. Like if you're for a magazine ban, you're probably for an assault weapons ban. Now, it's I think it's a slightly harder lift to go to the assault weapons ban. But, uh, you know, that that's where I look to for my inspiration yeah. of like, who should I be watching? And it's. it's yeah, no, people. I think it's a good proxy. Yeah and, yeah. and they're close on those guys. There's there were seven Democrats who, you know, the four Republicans didn't co-sponsor. And then there were seven Democrats who haven't, who didn't co-sponsor. I think they've already got 
three of those Democrats to say publicly that they're going to vote for it. So that leaves, you know, a little bit of a little bit of work left to do, but not an insurmountable task, I would say. Um, hmm. But, yeah, it's going to be super close. And I agree with you on the Senate. I don't think I don't think it's going to get to a vote. In this. I don't think they'll bring that up for a vote at all, because no way, man, I, it'd be hard to see them getting to 45 votes. Uh, I think. And none of those Senate Democrats, none of the moderate Democrats are going to want to vote on that either way. I mean, that's the other key thing here is like a lot of these House Democrats, um, you know, having to vote on it at all is going to be bad for them, regardless of what they decide to vote. Because even if they vote against it, uh, you know, as somebody in a a purple or more purple district, you know, that's still going to annoy some of the Democrats in that district. More than it yep. would if they never voted. I mean, that's the, the, the politics, the politician's paradox, I guess, is you never really want to vote on anything. But, well, but I think it's going to annoy some Democrats in two ways. I mean, there was uh, we've been talking polling. There was a, a CNN poll that came out earlier this week, and I it had a fascinating uh, result in that uh, majorities of Democrats and Republicans both felt like uh, Congress was not talking enough and congressional candidates were not talking enough about the issues that were important to them. Uh, and, and again, I think, it, you know, if you are concerned about the rising cost of living, if you are concerned about, you know, rising mortgage rates, you're worried about your wages not keeping up with inflation. Hey, do you really give a crap that Abigail Spanberger voted for a gun ban? Like, does that do anything to improve your life? Or if you're in Virginia's 7th District, are you annoyed that she's out there following, you know, the, the lead of Nancy Pelosi rather than actually doing something that matters? Uh, and so I think you're right. I think it is going to have an impact. In, in a number of these swing districts, um, but just not the impact that the Democrats are hoping for, right? I mean, it might rile up a little bit of their base. But I think it's going to annoy a lot of voters who say, why are you wasting your time on this stuff? Uh, you know, and, and to that end, I mean, we might even, I think we're probably seeing a bit of a backlash uh, like that in the red states with some of the, you know, abortion laws that uh, have been uh, put on the books. I think there is a frustration, broadly speaking, that politicians aren't focusing on the right things. Um, but nationally, the economy is the key issue. So yeah. if you're not focused on the economy, then you're aggravating and annoying and driving away voters right now. I think that's the bottom line. I think that's the biggest concern. The other thing I would note, too, is, uh, I mean, one, I think this the people this helps aren't the swing district people. And they, and they might they probably wrote those people off already, frankly, uh, given the the political atmosphere. So the the person who might be helped by something like this is somebody in like a a Biden plus seven or a Biden plus 10 district who's going to be uncomfortably close, if not losing, uh, you know, come November. And so maybe having an assault weapons ban to their credit uh, turns out some more of their activists. I think the one of the biggest problems with that idea, though, is that if they wanted to use guns as a wedge issue, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that bipartisan bill uh, then, you know, because that takes a lot of the wind out of this because they just yeah, did something it, it, guns. it does. But I don't know that they're going to be talking much about it. I mean, because, again, go back to the polling. It seems like a lot of Americans are broadly dissatisfied. Right. Sure. You didn't think, if you were a Democrat, it didn't go far enough. If, if you're a Republican, it went too far. Um, so I think there are going to be a lot of Democrats who just kind of quietly drop that bill and maybe talk about, you know, fighting for common sense gun reform. But it'll be included as part of it'll be, you know, this is what we did, but we need to do more. Uh, we got to ban these assault weapons, which is why I cast my vote for this. Uh, it'll probably be coupled with that. I mean, that seems yeah. to be the messaging that we've seen since the bill be, signing. I just think it's going to be a hard sell to go in and say oh, Republicans are are holding up progress on guns when they literally just passed the first you know, major federal gun bill in 30 years uh, at the same in the same Congress. It's just that it just makes it that much harder to to make this argument because you, you just the whole reason you pass an assault weapons ban in the House uh, is that you're trying to blame Republicans for blocking it in the Senate, which also doesn't really follow because it's going to be Democrats who block it in the Senate because there aren't going to be 50 votes for it. But, you are expecting yeah. way too much truth and accuracy from campaign ads, Stephen Gutowski. I, you, you, yeah. you sweet summer child, you. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah. No, you're right. That's 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 the reality. But that's not how it's going to be portrayed in, in attack ads. I'm asking. Yeah, just I just I just think like this, a sophisticated voter is going to understand is going to like 
I don't know that it's going to really appeal to them, but also like your non-sophisticated voter who just, who knows like, well, they just did a gun. Didn't they just pass a gun thing? How, you know, it's just, it's going to soften the blow of any attack, which is exactly what McConnell said was the reason they did. <laughs> they did the bipartisan yeah. bill. Uh, he, he was not shy about the political logic behind it. Um, and so I think it does take some of this, at least some of this thing out of whatever attack you might base uh, on uh, the fact that it, the assault ban doesn't pass the Senate uh, and make it to law. But, uh, you know, and then, you know, obviously it all goes back to just, it's just not that popular of a policy anyway. But um, but, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think we've covered it pretty good there. I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see if they can actually gather those votes and and get it through the house i mean if they don't that's fairly embarrassing but it's there's also like the nadler uh um aspect of it he's in a big fight with another uh incumbent they they just you know they merge districts or uh, mm -hmm. and so part of this may also have been that he needed to do something himself show that he was able to get this through his committee um I think that's yeah, because he is the I think he is the underdog against Carolyn Maloney right now in that race. Uh, it, it seems like Maloney is the fundraising advantage. I haven't seen any internal polling, but uh, I, I know it's impossible. I just wish there was a way that we could have done redistricting so that Jerry Connolly had to run in the same district as uh, Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney. I know that O'Connell's <laughs> uh, or, uh yeah, uh, he, he's in Virginia, not New York, but uh, he's my least favorite member of Congress. I just would love to see a way to get Connolly out of there, too. Anyway, Steve, I do I just, appreciate uh, the invite, man. Yes. And, and uh, you know, I just think that's a funny personal aspect to it that makes a lot of sense, too. That Nadler, the reason he brought it up was part of that. But but I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Can you tell people I really appreciate you coming on the show. Just tell people where they can find more of your writing to follow this. Yeah, you bet. Uh, BearingArms.com is the website. We also do the Bearing Arms Cam and Company podcast, of which Stephen appears uh, as often as I can entice him to uh, to come on. Um, you can find that YouTube, Rumble, all the major podcast platforms. We do it uh, Monday through Thursday. Basically, uh, try to do one guest a day uh, and then talk about we've got an armed citizen story every day. We've got a uh, uh, what I call the recidivist report, which is just highlighting a failure of the criminal justice system, which is where I think we need to be paying a lot more attention um, and then we have a segment just called the good deed of the day because there's way too much negative news out there. So we try to highlight somebody who did something good for somebody else. So anyway, like yeah. I said, man, always, always enjoy the conversation. Thanks again for having me on. Absolutely. You know, I, I think Bearing Arms makes a, a good compliment to the reload. So if you like what we're doing here, you'll probably like Bearing Arms as well. So go check them out. Uh, anyway, we're on to our news update now. All right. We are back with contributing writer. Jake Fogelman this week is back on the show, uh, ironically, from a trip that he's taking, uh, but he's off last week. We had uh, contributing editor Paul Crookston. Now we have uh, Jake back on the show. Welcome back to the show, Jake. Yeah, it's good to be back. As you can see, no guitars in the background. I'm in a <laughs> hotel room here in Seattle, so it's good to be here. Yes, thank you for doing the show. Paul is also traveling. He's in Alaska, I believe, already yeah. up there, so uh, you are the the <laughs> the closer to uh high speed internet i guess uh, yeah. person on on vacation but uh but you've also been writing pieces this week uh so you, you've still got a, a several stories up at the reload um two actually both of them are on the same topic right uh the recent mall shooting in indiana and the armed civilian who intervened to stop that shooting to end it um, can you give us give us more details about what happened there? Yeah, so most of you probably know by the time this comes out, but uh, last Sunday there was a, as you said, a shooting. Um, a young man walked into a, a mall just south of Indianapolis and just began open firing with a, a rifle. Um, but now we know because of police reports um, and some of uh, eyewitness statements that there was an armed bystander just at, happened to be at the mall. And then within 15 seconds, he drew his handgun and put the shooter down. Um, and some of the details around, you know, the timeline and, and sort of uh, how the shooting broke down is pretty impressive. I, apparently, the guy was, <clears throat> excuse me, about 40 yards away from the shooter uh, and fired 10 rounds and hit the shooter eight times. Uh, so pretty impressive marksman. This yeah. is a 22 year old young man, uh, Elijah Dickin is his name. So just 
unbelievable. Um, fortunately, he was there and likely saved many lives. Yeah, and I believe uh, their latest timeline from uh, police indicates that he had started uh, firing back within uh, like a minute of the shooting beginning, which is pretty incredible. Um, also gives you sort of an insight, uh, gives you some idea about how quickly these things can happen because right. the attacker did manage to murder three people and injure two That's more. Right. Uh, he shot off about 20 rounds, I believe, of, from his rifle uh, before Eli uh, Dickin, Elijah Dickin, was able to respond using his own handgun. Um, but yeah, certainly that uh, high stress situation, long distance shooting, much longer than you might expect in a self-defense encounter. Uh, those usually occur within, you know, seven yards uh, this is 40 yards. That's a long way, right? And uh, he's got eight hits out of 10 shots on a, you know, moving target at that distance in that time frame. is pretty, pretty remarkable shooting uh, for somebody who, uh, I mean, he didn't have any specialized training, no law enforcement or military training. That's right. Uh, he actually didn't even have a concealed carry permit. Interestingly, uh, he benefited from the state's recent uh, permitless carry legislation actually went into effect this month and he was carrying legally without the need for a permit because he didn't have any, uh, as far as we're aware, as far as police have told everyone, he didn't have any record that would keep him from being able to do so. And um, yeah, so he, he was able to end this shooting and that's obviously caused uh, quite a lot of uh, stir in the political world. Uh, which is another thing that you've written about you know, for in a member's piece, uh, this this sort of political response to, to what happened here. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So it, like you said in the piece, I kind of dub it, it's basically like a Rorschach test, right? It's however you view guns in general is sort of how you viewed this situation, it seems to me. Um, so folks that aren't particularly fond of guns or, or would like to see more gun control laws really downplayed the actions of, of Eli in this case uh almost to a shocking degree at least early on well uh, you saw folks and you actually saw some people um attack him more or less i mean that's i don't know right. what other word you'd use for it they you had some gun control leadership publicly calling him a you know labeling him a vigilante or a, a implying that he was carrying illegally uh, which turned out not to be true but uh yeah it, most people were obviously like uh, happy about him being able to be there to st and taking action to save people's lives. Um, the mall itself even praised his actions. The police praised his actions, called him a hero. Um, but yeah, not, not, uh, and the NRA and gun rights groups have used his, this incident as uh, evidence of, uh, of, of the, the effectiveness of permitless carry or the good guy with a gun sort of trope. But, but yeah, certainly you've seen the opposite reaction. Uh, in varying degrees. Now, look, I, I think most right. of the reaction on the gun control side was mainly just to ignore that this happened or to say, no, ignore that he stopped the shooting and focus on the fact that this person still killed three people, which is which is a fair point, right? This was not not a perfect solution to what happened, obviously, because three people still died. But and so they'll they'll focus on the the violence uh, that occurred before it was stopped. Uh, you saw that's what Giffords did, um, but. Uh, and that's eventually what I think you saw from Brady as well, even though their president, uh, Chris Brown, was initially uh, implying that that this was vigilante vigilantism, uh, stopping the shooting. Uh, later on, they put out a much softer statement about how it was good, but not a solution. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, you, you still saw, you know, Shannon Watts from Moms Demand Action falsely claiming that this was illegal and really kind of, uh, you know, attacking this this kid for getting involved. Sure. Yeah. And, and to the point of the where the illegal trope comes from, uh, I guess the mall apparently had a no weapons policy, which a lot of malls do, a lot of businesses do. Um, and so for folks who don't know, when a pr private business has a policy like that, it depends on the state. Uh, some states are different than others. But in this case, in Indiana, there's no force of law behind that sign that doesn't make him a criminal for carrying on the on that property. Right. Uh, the only legality there would be if someone from the mall 
asked him to leave the property and he didn't, because yeah. he was carrying. Yeah. Then then he could so, be charged for trespass. It's kind of they're very right, similar to uh, like a no shirt, no shoes policy at a store. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, at like a convenience store, like that's not illegal for you to go in there with no shirt on. <laughs> if they ask right. you to leave though, and you don't, then you could be arrested for trespassing. Right. Um, right. It's a store policy. It's not. It's not law. And and I will say too, a lot of malls. They might have this a policy about weapons somewhere in a fine print document, some you know, on their website or uh, somewhere at the mall. But most of them don't do what what you usually would see with no gun signs, which is to actually post them at every right. entrance. Um, in fact, I don't know that I've ever seen a mall that actually has the little you know gun with a cross threat right. sign posted at their doors. So that you know, that's another issue with the. A lot of states require you to have clear postage on that issue. So we don't know if what this Indiana mall actually did in practice. But regardless, as you said, it wouldn't it's not a right. Crime. And the fact that you know, as you said, the mall actually put out a statement and thanked him for doing what he did, um, right, kind of shows you where that where that's at. Uh, so obviously, it kind of makes you wonder why they have that policy. If that's yeah. how I feel. <laughs> One might wonder. Yeah, exactly. Because obviously the policy didn't stop the assailant from bringing his rifle in there. And thankfully, the, the young man from Indiana uh, was brought his as well and was well trained with it. But uh, just an interesting response to see, like you said, people uh, instead of just taking the time to say, even if you're even if you're a gun control activist, even if you don't want to rely on armed civilians to handle situations like this, it's still a, a net benefit in this case that more people weren't killed because of someone's quick thinking. You can at least acknowledge that fact. So it's just bizarre to try to point out different ways that this guy might be a vigilante or breaking the law somehow. Right. And I guess that, and one, I uh, should point out too, that, that the attacker had, he had three different guns yep. on him and uh, quite a lot more ammunition than what he ended up actually shooting. So it seems likely that he would have killed a lot more people had he not been shot by uh, Dickon in this case. So uh, I think it's fairly un unquestionable at this point that he saved lives. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, as you as you note in your piece, it, does that mean that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun? Uh, not necessarily, right? You, you went over some of the statistics and some of the things that have been pointed out uh, at, at other media outlets. Uh, you know, about active shooter situations and how frequently they're stopped with, uh, you know, by armed bystanders. Um, or to be fair, I think good guy with a gun to me also obviously implies police officer. Um, you know, when, when Wayne LaPierre made that quote, sure, he meant to include police officers. And so, you know, there, there were four armed civilians that that killed a shot and killed an active shooter in 2021, according to the FBI. Uh, there were, what, 14 more. Uh, police officers who did the same, mm -hmm. uh, and then 30 more were arrested without, you know, being killed. Right. Um, and so that's what that is. It's, uh, 40, um, 48 eight, and yeah. the rest, so, rest, the active shooter killed themselves before anyone could intervene. Right. So the, out of the 61, uh, you know, so, you know, the numbers are important to keep in mind and, and yes, armed civilians are not the main way that an active shooting is brought to an end. But it does happen, and it is it certainly is possible. This is certainly not the first time it's happened, um, and it's one likely to be the last time. And, and I think that's a more than legitimate point to make uh, about the situation. Like We want to be clear about the context and the numbers, but uh, the idea that this does not happen or could not happen is something that has been put forward uh, often by at least the more bombastic gun uh, control activists out there. Yeah. Uh, are saying that kind of, I mean, Uvalde was a great example of this. They, they, they said repeatedly that this disproves the idea of, uh, you know, a good guy with a gun because the police in Uvalde just did not intervene, um, which is a very, which was never really a repudiation of the idea that someone could intervene or, or, or uh, that the shooting could have been prevented or, st or at least stopped uh, before it got as far as it did. Uh, the attacker could have been stopped before he got as far as he did. But, uh, you know, in that case, that's incompetence or, uh, you know, mismanagement or, or just, uh, uh, you know, to a, an absolutely egregious level. 
uh, cowardice, whatever else you want to call what happened in Uvalde, it doesn't disprove the idea that somebody could uh, take on an active shooter and stop them, uh, as we saw in this Indiana mall shooting. And, it, you know, you had a lot of talking points that were disproved, right? There was, uh, there's also this, this, there was a whole line of argument about how, because the shooter in Uvalde had an, an AR-15, that the gun was so scary to these cops uh, that 400 of them couldn't intervene. And that number is not an exaggeration. The report came out recently that 400 police officers were on the scene of uh, Robin Elementary School before uh, they actually went in. The four officers actually went in to confront the shooter. But, you know, here you have a situation is, again, a rifle. I believe it's a, an AR-15 has been the reports. And uh, this was a 22-year-old uh, civilian with a handgun right. who, who took him on and ended the shooting. That's right. It's, not, it's certainly not impossible. Not, not even the first time. Not even the first time in recent memory. There was also the West Virginia incident where somebody opened fire on a crowd of people at a park with an AR-15 and a, a woman with a concealed carry license fired back, killing the attacker without anyone else being harmed. So uh, we don't need this mall shooting as an example, but it is exactly that. It's an example of this situation happening. It's not a myth. It's not made up. Um, so I don't know, you have any, any final thoughts on on that whole situation? No, like you said, I think you pretty much covered it just the way that, especially this incident in particular, just really seemed to intersect with a lot of gun politics flashpoints. You had the permitless carry scenario because mm -hmm. their policy just kicked into law. You have gun-free zones as a policy, obviously, when a, when a place has a no weapons allowed sign, but obviously guns on both the good side and the bad guy side sh still showed up. Uh, and then, like you said, armed civilians defending against active shooters, it's just... Uh, just a, a really good example of the ways that these policies can work out in the real world. Um, and in this case, fortunately, a young man was able to prevent further bloodshed. And uh, so, yeah, definitely. Yeah, certainly. And, and I think, too, that because of all of those intersections, that's why you saw such a strong negative reaction yeah. from some uh, gun control advocates, some high profile ones. Um, which later they perhaps realized were not the best takes or going yeah. to resonate very well with most people because uh, Shannon Watts deleted her tweet, Tom saying that what the shooter did was illegal and Chris Brown from Brady eventually put out a diff another statement that was much softer uh, that praised the, the uh, reaction of, the, uh, of Eli Dickin. Uh, but said it wasn't uh, a good solution, which is a different debate, of course, um, and and uh, one that you covered pretty well in these in these pieces. But yeah, I think that's all we've got for this week. So, um, you know, if you want to learn more about the reload, you should head on over to reload.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter if you haven't already. If you waited this far in the podcast and you haven't been signed up for the newsletter, I'm not sure what you're doing out there, folks. Uh, but you know, you sign up for the free newsletter, you'll get an I idea of what our reporting is really like. You'll get a roundup every Friday morning of the biggest news stories in guns from across the country. And, um, if you buy a membership, you'll get even more access. You'll get to read all of what, uh, Jake's members piece says, uh, that piece that we were describing there, that's, that's a member exclusive. So if you, you have to have a membership to read it. And uh, you, if you get a membership, you'll also receive this podcast a day early and have opportunity to appear on the show. We'd love to do another member segment soon uh, here as well. Uh, so email, reach out if you are a member and want to be on the show. Uh, go ahead and email me. Re reply to your Sunday newsletter, which is another benefit of membership. And uh, let us know. We'd love to have you on. But uh, that's it for this week. We will see you guys again soon.